Hello, I'm Gary Willock. Today we're going to be talking about roofing up to a wall. Some people call it an abutment. Confusing, I guess. But roofing up to a wall, whether it is the wall of the house, a second story, or a chimney wall, or whatever. <clears throat> we're going to talk about what I see out there um, on a real regular basis the majority of the time and we're going to talk about how that's failing how that's not working and we're going to talk about going back to traditional roofing methods methods that are approved tried and proven and taught by the National Roofing Contractors Association this should always be a starting point uh, for anybody that you hire doing roofing if they don't have the basics uh, they probably don't have the skills to be roofing. It is not rocket science, granted, but there's a lot of things that roofers simply don't know about roofing. It's a real shame. say this about where we're going with this today I would recommend you don't just take what I say because I'm on YouTube as the absolute truth there's ways to figure out and find out but probably the most probably the best thing I can recommend is that you pull yourself aside from what you hear and see on YouTube uh, pull yourself aside take yourself over to the common sense corner of your little room and go okay does this really make sense? Does this guy really know what he's talking about? Or am I trying to be influenced? Am I trying to be persuaded? Am I being sold something? And I don't know about you, but I hate being sold. I love to buy, but I hate being sold. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. How many people are buying and paying extra for stuff when the stuff's not even working? And that's exactly what I found. There's a, <laughs> a competitor right here in Austin, Texas. I love this. And they did a, and they, they used the technical word abutment. How do you roof up against an abutment? And I'll show you exactly what they did and I will show you exactly why that will fail. Now here I've got, what they had is just an L flashing. It's just a piece of metal that comes down and out onto the roof. And you see that pretty often here. Now, uh, typically you would see the siding that would go over this and cover this, and behind the siding there should be a house wrap felt or something that catches any moisture that goes through the knot hole on the siding or anything like that that takes it out on top of the flashing. That part is pretty typical. Uh, National Roofing Contractors Association says this should be four inches. I like to go the four inches. The Uniform Building Code or the uh, International Building Code says four inches too. I like for that to be four inches. Now, what we're looking at here is what this other company did that makes me nuts because Peel and Stick, even though there's some really good products, and this is one of the ones I've used for the longest time, and I found it is a really good product if properly used. So it is a pill and stick product, but pill and stick is not a absolute answer for everything. It does not stop water if you use it incorrectly, and this is an incorrect install. What they did, they were all excited. I think it was a salesman on a ladder. It looks like he never got on the roof to take the video. And you had a very sharp young guy, a roofer, that has not been trained the very basics of roofing. He's the one deciding the standards and specifications and the way the roof is going on this particular roof. So he stops the underlayment. This is the underlayment. This is uh, the new synthetic type underlayment. This is Summit 60 from Atlas. And uh, this is, we're mixing up some products because I'm just grabbing them out of the shop. We're using StormGuard from GAF. Uh, there's a multitude of products out there and a lot of great products. There's a lot of them that aren't so great too. Find somebody who knows the difference when you start looking at products. But we're going to use these two. These are great products. Uh, we're going to throw this in here. The, the, the guy that was doing the roof, he ran his underlayment, the synthetic, over about this close to the wall cut it off, saves a little bit, and then they sold the owner 
I'm, I'm assuming that they were going to use an ice and water shield against the wall abutment. Now, by saying abutment, you know a word that probably other roofers aren't using. It makes you sound smart, and maybe you can sell the job, I guess. I just think that's an interesting term. Up against the wall here, what I would want to see, if you're going to use ice and water shield, ideally what you would want to see, if you're going to use ice and water shield, and if you're going to use an L flashing, you would want this ice and water shield to go up and up onto the wall before the flashing was on. That way you catch water. Because here's the simple question. Putting it on like this, what did they really gain? Now they, they, they peeled it apart and they stuck it down all the way up, all the way underneath there. But let me ask you, what in your common sense corner did they accomplish? Here's what they accomplished. Nothing! Expensive pill and stick versus putting the basic underlayment all the way underneath. Either way, the water's going to run underneath if it gets down to this level and go behind and into the wall. And man, do we see a lot of that anymore. The builders and roofers are using the turnback flashing. Now this one was picked up at a big box store and if you're going to buy flashing of any kind, you want to have it specced out. What thickness? Trust me, this is oh too thin and comes from a big box store. This is a turnback flashing that could have been used here. That would have helped because at least when the shingles come over here, you've got this little channel that's keeping the water from getting onto the underlayment. But still, is it any better to have this ice and water shield or uh, ice and water, water protection, extra protection, a pill and stick against the wall, against the abutment? Doesn't gain you a thing because if it gets on this and runs down, that's great. Or if it gets on this and runs down, that's great. But what keeps it from going underneath? I maintain there is nothing. The only way you can do that is to go back to a pooky roof. Now that's what my guys call using caulk and adhesives, uh, mastic, tar, pooky roof, and pooky that like they do on so many of the tile roofs, and then that keeps water from going underneath there until that cracks. <laughs> now I'm going to throw a few shingles up here, cut them, I'll be right back, I'll show you how to put in some step flashing so you end up putting the water back on top of the roof. Call me old fashioned, but I think the water, instead of running on a channel beneath, instead of running on ice and water shield underneath, instead of running on uh, Winter Guard or any of the products that you stick in underneath and extra sales money, use some old fashioned methodology that goes back as far as wood shingles and as far as slate products go back in time, hundreds of years, that have always worked, and that is step flashing. We're going to be these are step flashing, and this is the typical size that we use. Now this is uh, 24 gauge steel, uh, galvanized, and um, that's pretty rigid. Uh, 26 is my preference on shingles, so there's nothing in between that uh, could get kinked and hold up those shingles. Now uh, a step flashing, step flashings have been used for years and years and years. There's no way that water is going to run underneath a step flashing without being carried to the top with the one below it. And I'll show you how that works. Now, you always want to start the roof with a starter shingle. This is not a proper starter shingle. This is for the example of showing you how step flashing works. And therefore, we're going to be using a staple gun and taking a few shortcuts. But where the step flashing goes, you want the five inches out on the, out on the roof, the four inches up the wall. In any place you can, run the underlayment up the wall. Even if you can only get a little bit, run it up the wall. You have a shingle come loose, water gets underneath your step flashing and shingle system, you will still be protected. That's really the only time. Now, on a first one, you're gonna to want to put a very special one that has a kick out, depending on where the water is gonna go in this area. There may be a, a gutter here, uh, but then this flashing goes down and you can actually nail this flashing down. The shingle comes over the top of it like that, goes in place, and then another flashing goes on. Now the next shingle is going to come back down to about right here, so you want to hold this up a little bit further than that, so you don't get in between the adhesive there. Now here's, here's what you're really doing. You're overlapping this shingle over this shingle. Now if water gets in underneath 
the shingle here, or let me show you actually on the next one. Let me put one more shingle in here. So if the water gets into underneath this shingle, it's going to get on top of this shingle and it's going to come back out on top of the roofing right here. The whole process of step flashing is kicking the water back on top. And of course these would be nailed, the flashing can be nailed right through the flashing, right through the shingle. We have never seen one leak. You want to do a good job of that, of course, and there are some things you need to know about that, but uh, that is the way that it's done. You can fasten that into the back. Now, again, I like instead of this 24 gauge, I mean, this is some rigid stuff here. Uh, you can actually use a 26 gauge. What you want to do when it's up against the wall, you see that one's bent a little more than 90 degree. You want to make it a little bit less than 90 degree. So when you nail it in place, pow, there goes your nail right there. It stays up against the wall real tight and has a nice look. Then the next shingle comes on, and so you can see that you're creating a pattern of no matter how much water you put in there, you can run a water hose on this. It's going to keep coming out, bleeding out on the shingles down below it, so you never end up with a leak. And this whole thing of the turn back flashing, we're going to address that just a little bit more and why I like step flashing so much. Now, I've made some videos on this after going out on home, after home, after home, after home, after home. Hundreds, not dozens, hundreds, hundreds of homes. Every time it rains, we see the same old problem. The problem with a turn back flashing that would have gone on there like this, and then the shingles lay over it, it creates a little gutter system below your roofing. Number one, Gary's Rules of Roofing. <laughs> Gary's Rules of Roofing. Keep the water on top of the roofing, the roofing, not the underlayments, not the fancy abutments uh, layer of ice and water shield, none of that stuff. Keep the water on top of the doggone roofing, in this case shingles. So instead of doing that, where what does it take for this to fail? Number one, in Austin we have a lot of trees here. Uh, if you haven't seen trees in Texas, you've got to come to Austin. It's an incredible place. It's just green. It is the oasis. Visit the oasis. You'll see a house that we did below that. One of the wonderful mansions along Lake Travis. But the shingles that go over this, and again, over it and over it, there's these areas where the shingles get hot and they're kind of laying down into this gutter system. And this channel is one of the accepted ways of doing it in accordance to the National Roofing Contractors Association. However, with tile and some things, it probably makes a lot more sense than it does with shingles. Shingles get soft, it's going to lay down in there. Any debris that gets in here, and there will be debris if you have trees. There will be debris if you have trees, it's going to happen. The next shingle goes under there, all of a sudden it's stopped up, running over. Or, even worse, you've got wood siding up here. You've got brick somebody's trying to maintain. You have somebody come up here, work on this wall above this flashing, and they step on this little turn-back flashing. Now you don't have a turn-back flashing, you just have a piece of L flashing, and any water that comes out runs right there, and of course it runs right back in underneath. So, man, I just really dislike turn-back flashing for shingles because inevitably somebody's going to be on your roof, somebody's going to step on that, and if you have trees, it's a matter of how many years will you get by before the turn back flashing gets smashed, probably to your first paint job, because those guys have to get all over the roof to be able to do their job. Now, you've got my take and you kind of got my intensity, if you would, on use step flashing, keep the water on top of the shingles. Anybody that likes that, please give me a thumbs up uh, on that water on top of the shingles. Now, I know a lot of the roofers that like to take shortcuts are going to give me a thumbs down. So let's see how many thumbs down we get because if you're giving me a thumbs down, you're not going back into your common sense corner and thinking about this. How easy is it to damage this turn back flashing? One step. In this case, it was bought, it was purchased at a big box store, so just the press of the thumb, didn't even have to step on it to flatten it out completely, and it shot. When you put on a roof, there's supposed to be lifetime shingles now, but that's a misnomer. We're going to talk about that on another video. 
But the problem is a turn back flashing only makes it until the painting or any, any trees, any debris gets in and stops it up and you've got a leak. Step flashing, step flashing. Once again, use your own common sense and think about what really makes sense when you start talking about replacing a roof that now costs thousands of dollars. Your average roof today is ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars for a composition shingle. Uh, the one I was on yesterday that we're going to be doing in a couple of weeks here, twenty-four thousand dollars. It's a pretty basic uh, roof. The, there were some things that they did not talk about, and that is what above the flashing. And that's for different videos, but there are more things that have to be known to get a good watertight roof for the life of that roof other than just the basic shingles and basic flashing. There are other things. So you're going to want to hire somebody to do your work that has the knowledge, home building, and what causes leaks. If they haven't serviced a lot of leaks, they probably don't know, bottom line. If you don't go out and service leaks, if you're just a salesman for a roofing company, chances are you could get sold something. Have a great day. Okay, almost went away too quick there. One more thing, and this is for the roofers, roofers, roofers. Um, you know, I had a subcontract crew come out on a commercial job where we had a large amount of shingles up against a wall abutment like this, up against a wall. It's actually a parapet wall on this uh, commercial project. And um, when they were putting on the step flashing, and I was the supervisor myself on that job, they were putting caulk here. <laughs> oh my God! No, 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 no! Now you're trapping water in on the flashing that's going to back up and go behind the shingle, guys. Step flashing does not require caulking. Get away from this new era of roofing where everything is pookied into place. No, 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 no. Step flashing is a permanent fix. Caulking stops it up. Don't go with caulking.